darkness. He is a great I am that I am. He is a promise keeper. Oh, hallelujah. He's a faithful God. The Bible says His mercies are new every morning. Every morning we wake up, His mercies are new towards us. Father, we give you praise and thanks for this wonderful time. Glory be to your name. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory. You're all welcome to church. You're all welcome to church. Um, you can sit briefly. We'll go back to worship afterwards. But this is Koi. This is a place where we exist to make a lasting difference in your life. That with Jesus Christ, you can have a remarkable life. That's our vision. That is our goal. And we do this by teaching th teachings that are real, that are radical, that can reach out. And so we want to welcome all of you. If you're here for the first time, can you just raise up your hand? Let me see. Anybody here for the first time? Can we give them a clap? Glory. Thank you for visiting Koi, and we hope you will come back again. And we pray that God will bless you even as you worship with us today. Uh, Pastor is not with us, but he would like to... Uh, give us a, a few moments of greetings from Pastor. Can we have the, the video? Looking forward to the new series at the movies. Le help me welcome Levely, he will going to take the offering. God is good. Ooh, oh, I love God. I, I really do. God does the impossible. I mean, nothing is impossible for God. When I think about God, I think about how he created everything. And he created everything with systems. So it's a universe that has galaxies, and galaxies have solar systems, solar systems have planets. I'm like, my goodness. God does the impossible. And for him to do the impossible in your life, you need faith. Right? You need faith for him to apply his impossible to your limited world so that you can see him working in your life. Right? Now... The scripture he gave me was Joshua 1 verse 2. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites, to the children of Israel. 
in other words, in other words, get ready to step out, right? Get ready to cross over, right? In verse 4, he's telling us, stepping out is the only way our territory can expand. It's the only way we can increase. And then you give, he gives us in verse 6, 7, and 9, he tells us, be strong, be courageous. And he gives us an application, a way to apply that. Be strong and courageous, and then he gives us something to apply. Every single one is different. And he gives us context on how to be strong, how to be courageous, so that he can work in our lives. And he gives us the instruction in Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring the full tithes into the storehouses, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, and you will see him multiply in your life. He's going to, in other words, he's just saying, bring your best and I'll bring mine. Right? Bring your best, I'll bring mine. I'll take care of everything else. Right? Right? That just blows me away. Because that's the only scripture where, that I've seen where he, he asks us to test him. Right? And he comes through every single time. Right? So I just want, wanted you guys to be encouraged by that word. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. Um, the, one of the ushers is going to give you an envelope. Let's pray over the offering. Let's bring our best so he can do the impossible in our lives. Right? Raise your offerings. Let's pray over it. Father God, we thank you for your love. Thank you for being the impossible God. Does the impossible. And you are the one who has no limits. We thank you. We bring our best before you. We ask that you expand our territories. We follow your word. We follow you, your instruction. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration, Lord. Knowing that you rebuke the devourer on, for our sake. That you are the one who increases in our lives. Every good thing comes from you. We thank you right now. Lord, we give you our best. In Jesus' name, amen. worship and song, stand on your feet as we go back into, um, or continue with worshiping our Heavenly Father who has given us his very best, amen. Thank you, Jesus.
one more time. Let's tell our week that he's higher. time we give you praise we thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness thank you for this time of worship and thank you for the time of reading of scripture and exposition of the word father i pray that as my word goes forth that it will not return unto you void it will accomplish the purpose for which you have sent it out for father i pray that everyone under my voice this morning will be blessed in the name of jesus christ that we won't leave this place the same way we came in Whatever issues are standing on our way, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you will minister to us at the point of our needs. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come against forces of darkness that would like to take up the word, that will not allow the word to get into our hearts and to bring forth fruit. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You have no portion, you have no part in this service. We turn over the whole service in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, take full charge of every word that will be said out of this pulpit and bless everyone that is here. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you dear Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Greetings to you all in the name of Jesus Christ. The name that is above every other name. You know, if you walk into an office and you say to the officer, I've been sent by the president, you get the listening ears, right? Because of the name. The name of Jesus is great in heaven and on earth and beneath the earth. We've been doing the series on defining moment, and we've had a, a few speakers. The pastor and uh, Estelle did a wonderful job, and today I would like to be focusing on fear. I never thought in my life I would be afraid to serve in church. Because I have always served since I was in high school. There is literally no church, no fellowship, no Christian organization that I have joined that I have not been in leadership position. 41 years in the Lord. And literally, for most of those 41 years, I have served. But in 2013, something happened in the last church where I was that made me to be afraid to want to serve for the first time. February 2013. Myself and a few friends of mine, Chinemba, Brother Za, is Za in the house, Okay, Zai is not in the house today. I'm Brother Saki Nicodemus. We were trying to help a pastor because things were not going right in our church. And instead of helping the pastor, we got thrown out of church. <laughs> February 2013, we were given dismissal letters. <laughs> Have you ever received a dismissal letter from any church? No. Well, I did. <laughs> he did. They did. The four of us. And after that, I mean, imagine this. I was given a dismissal letter on a Saturday. All my life I've gone to church. There must be something really serious to keep me out of church. Because the best place to be is in the church. 
I can't imagine myself missing church. But I woke up this Sunday morning not knowing where to go to. And I had to tell Lizzie and David that we're not going to church today. Why? I couldn't just tell them why. Just put yourself in my shoe. Imagine my brother there, Chinemba. Little did I know that that was my defining moment. And I'll finish the story later on. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me with the first book of Samuel, chapter 17. And I'm going to discuss the issue of fear and how to face fear. Hopefully we will uh, go through this scripture. It's a long, very lengthy scripture I would like to read. But I will skip a few and then I would like us to look through this scripture and find some if you like, some timeless principles that will help us in facing our fears. We all face different types of fears. When you read the word fear in the Bible, there are two types of fears. There is the fear, like the fear of darkness or a phobia, a fear for height. That is different. But then you have this fear that is internal. Like, I'm afraid to make a move. I'm afraid to leave my job because I'm not sure whether I'm going to get another job. Or I'm afraid to, for the unknown. And we all have our different moments of fear. We have some moments where we are really afraid that we do not know what to do. Fear clouds your mind and inhibits innovation. When you're fearful, your innovative mind is no longer functioning because of fear. Fear does not allow you to think clearly and hence or uh, adversely affects your decision. When you are afraid, don't be in a haste to make a decision. Take your time because fear will cloud your mind and will adversely affect your decision. Never be terrorized into making a decision. When you are in church and the pastor terrorizes you and says you should empty your wallet and you have fear, don't do it. We have people in churches that have been kept because of fear. They can't even go to any other church. They are told if you go out of this church, you will be cursed. Let me announce to you that if you are a child of God, the Bible says that you are in Christ who is in God. You are not in the pastor. You are in Christ. So who is your covering? Christ. Fear. Fear. Fear has been used to manipulate people. Fear has been used to deceive people. Fear was used or is still being used by the so-called witch doctors. In the village, he knows everything about the spiritual things happening in the village. And so whatever he says, the villagers will believe him. So he uses fear to bewitch the people. In this story we're about to read is the story of David and Goliath. This is a Sunday school story. I mean, we all have this story when we're in Sunday school. I mean, David and Goliath, this huge giant, this warrior, and David came with his sling and a few stones, and he was able to kill Goliath. But let's look at this story a bit closely today. And as I said, I would like to read from verse 1, and I will skip a few uh, verses. This is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, just to give you a background, Saul, King Saul and the Israelites were fighting battles left, right, center. In fact, the Bible said that Saul was harassing his neighbors, which means he was victorious. All the wars he fought, he won the wars. But then we come to chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, and we see another kind of war that Saul was fighting the Philistines. And this time around, it was a face-off between the Israelites and the Philistines. 
And so the Bible says that now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and we are gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Aseka in Ephes Dan Damim. Okay. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up the battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. That's about, uh, that's about three, uh, nine feet, which is approximately three meters. It's 2.7 meters, so approximately three meters, you know, if you convert from... So just imagine that. Anybody here who is... Do you remember how high are you? Okay, you're not, okay. <laughs> He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear, of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. I don't want to even begin to tell you those weight in kgs. But if you've ever seen the Romans armory, the male jacket, if you put it on, you can hardly work because it's meant for warriors. It's meant for people that are of the size of a Goliath or Goliath or whatever. <laughs> But listen to what this champion said. Now, in these days, wars could be simplified to a battle between a representative of the enemies and a representative of the other camp. And whoever wins the fight, the other camp, the other camp have won the battle. So it was like a kind of trying to make a war that is not that expensive, an inexpensive battle, if you like. And this was a type of battle that the Philistines decided to go into with Israel. So the champion came out and he said, Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I wish he had stopped there. But the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel. This day, give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul, that is the king, and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This is a terror, a giant. And this represents whatever terrorizes you. This represents whatever is standing on the way that is uh, making you to be afraid to make a move. And in our lives, we've got this monster, this intimidating fear that stands against us and against our progress. And so the Philistines came out and made these statements, and the Israelites were afraid. Verse 16 said something that I would like to read. In verse 16, and the Philistine drew near and present himself 40 days, morning and evening. How embarrassing that the 
Israelites will come out, the Philistines will come out, there will be a battle array, they will appear to be ready for a battle, all clothed in arming armory with their weapons, looking at the enemy on the other side, and the champion will come out, and Israel will chicken out. And he will defy the army of Israel. And he did this 40 days. Morning and evening. This was becoming a really, really an embarrassing situation. 40 is the number of trial. 40 is the number of testing. Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Afterward, he was tempted by the devil. 40 is the number of trial. Moses was on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments and the Israelites were tested for 40 days and they missed it. They started to worship idols. The children of Israel, when they refused to listen to God and were so stubborn and were complaining, the Lord made them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until all those complainers except for Joshua and Caleb all died in the wilderness. To the Israelites, once it's 40 days and 40 nights, the trial is completed. Let's back up a little bit and go about David, verse 12. Now David was the son of that Ephraim, Ephratite of, Belf, of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons, and the man was all old, advanced in years, in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons, who Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, um, verse 14, David was the youngest. So out of eight sons, David was the youngest. The three first sons were at the battlefront with Saul. And David was the youngest, and we know the story. The father said to David, take some cheese, take some food to your brothers at the battleground. Now, how old was David? You may ask. Numbers chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that for any Israelite to go to battle, he must be 20 years of age and above, not below 20 years. So if there are eight sons and three were in the battlefield, it means that those three were 20 years and above. It means that the fourth child or the fourth son was not old enough to go to war which means he was below 20. Do the math. And David was the last. Eight sons. Just imagine that. Keep the picture of Goliath at the back of your mind. And just, just listen to this story of this peace and simple shepherd boy who was just an errant boy. He was asked to just take the food to the camp, see how your brothers are doing, and give them this. In fact, they even gave him food to give to the, to the commander of the thousands. They gave this to the commander of thousands. You know, it's like, okay, you are the one taking care of these uh, thousands, and my brothers are here, a little thing for you as well. Please just follow me gradually. Now let's see what happens when David arrived at the camp. In verse 20. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper and took the things and went in. Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going to the fight and shouted for the battle. So there is a camp inside and there is a battleground. So each morning they will wake up from the camp and they will go to the battleground. They will line up as if they are going to fight and they're just staring at one another. And Goliath will come out and he will say all the things he would like to say to them. Just imagine that. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up a battle array, army against army. 
army against army. So David arrived when they were moving to the battleground, and David left the supplies with the supply keeper, run to the battlefield to see what was happening. Of course, just imagine the age of David, 16, 15, 14, who knows? But definitely, he was much, much less than 20. If the others, number four, number five, number six, number seven, didn't go to war, assuming they have the same mother, of course. <laughs> you have to make some assumptions also. All right? <laughs> and so he arrived, and they were the battlefield. So he went there to see what was happening. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army and, uh, to the army and the camp, greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion. Just listen to the way the Bible even describes the whole scene. You know, it's like you're watching a movie already, okay? He said, then, you know, uh, verse, verse 23. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion the Philistine of Gath, Goliath. <laughs> Goliath by name. Coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, that is verse 8 and 9, the same words he spoke and defied the Israelites. So David heard them. Just imagine this. This young little boy arrived at the sea, and he heard what this champion was saying. Verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So <laughs> they were ready for battle. The champion came out declared what he normally declared, and they all like taking the bar because they were afraid. David, the little boy, was standing there. Allow me to call him a little boy. He was standing there and he saw this giant and he saw the reaction of the people from this giant. Now, Something I want to say. Is that a terrorizing situation could be your defining moment. A terrorizing situation could be your defining moment. Everybody was running backwards when they saw the giant. And David took note of this. Now, let's introduce David a little bit much better. The Bible says that David is the son of who? Jesse. Do you remember Ruth? Now, Ruth was not an Israelite. She was not a covenant woman. She was a woman from a heathen nation called Moab. So she was a Moabites, if you like, as the Bible would love to call her. And then we have the lady Naomi and Abimelech. And they left Judah and went to Moab because there was famine and there was hunger in Judah. So they went where they can find food. And while they were there, the two sons of Naomi got married, but both of them died. The wife of the one son, don't remember the names of the son, was Opa. And the, the name of the second was who? Ruth. Now, the two sons died, and in those days, the tradition is if the mother gives birth to another son, or if she had a son, that son could actually take this lady's for wife. It's tradition, it's culture, okay? But Naomi didn't have any child because the husband was dead, the two sons were dead, and Naomi was really like, what else can come out of me? 
So Naomi heard that the Lord had visited Judah and now there is food back home, so she wanted to go back home. She met with the two uh, daughters-in-laws and said to them, you go back home because I have to go back to Judah. And they said, no, we will go with you. Both of them said that. Then she insisted, no, 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 you can't come with me. I mean, even if you're going to wait for me to give birth to a son, will you wait that long, give birth to a son, then he grows up and then he marries you? Doesn't make sense, so please just go back. After that, Opa kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. We never heard anything about Opa. But then Ruth said to her mother-in-law, do not entreat me to go back. Do not force me to leave you. I will go with you wherever you go to. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Where you die, I will die. Just think of this commitment, this dedication, this absolute. She said, look, I'm no longer going to live for these gods of my forefathers. I'm going with you. I found something very special in you. I found something that is great. I found a God that is living. I'm not going to go back to the idols. I'm going to follow you. Ruth left with her mother-in-law, Naomi, found a husband by the name of Boaz. Boaz gave birth to Obed. Obed gave birth to J.C. J.C. gave birth to David. You know, in Nigeria at times, when somebody is doing something, either negative or positive, they'll say, whose son is this? Now, who Pekin be this? They want to know where are you coming from? And I want us to know where David was coming from. So now look at David, very young, shepherd boy, arriving this scene. The battle was going on. The Israelites were afraid. I mean, they were extra afraid. They were dismayed and afraid. And then David approach them. Now, if you look at verse 21, we talked about the Philistines had drawn up their battle array against each other. So it was army against army. Now look at verse 26. Then David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who? To, for who? I mean, David had the audacity. He was talking to military, experienced military people. And he had the what? The audacity to even act. He just asked, okay, what will be done to the guy who will defeat this? But then he added, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? When you get terrorized, Just know, you are a child of God. It's not you. It is the God behind you. Who is this uncircumcised? Now, circumcision was the mark of covenant. All male children in Israel were circumcised as a sign of covenant. Even Abraham, because it started with Abraham, in his old age, was circumcised. That was the seal of the covenant between the children of Israel and Jehovah God. The great I am that I am. The maker of the heavens and the earth. The one that dwells in heaven, and the Bible says that the earth is his footstool. The whole earth put together is but like a drop in the ocean before the almighty God. And David said, who is this uncircumcised, uncovenanted Philistine? 
that he should defy the armies of the living God. The champion said, are you not the servants of Saul? David said, these are the armies of the living God. Who are you to defy them? So that was the first encounter of David. And when David made that statement, the people said in verse 27, and the people answered him in this manner, saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. So let's hear the reward. Let's keep the distraction because Eliab, who is the first son, overheard this discussion. And you know, as elder brothers, I, I'm a middle child, so I know, you know, middle, middle, middle child, you know, you, you hear, you know, your elders, the way they talk to you, and you know, I will not be given tea at night because maybe I will wet the bed, you know, <laughs> what are you, you go away, stuff like that. And the elder brother started talking to to, to David in that manner. He said, you, we know why, I know why you are here. Your heart is so evil. You just came here to watch the fight. Get away from here. What do you think you are doing? Asking these kind of questions that warriors should be discussing. Getting involved in military affairs. Uh, you, are, you are not yet there. You've not been recruited. You are not yet at the age that you will be recruited into the army. What are you talking about? But let's just jump all of that. Numbers I think it was still in verse, uh, okay, now verse 30. Then he turned from him toward another and, and said to the same thing, and these people answered him as the first one. So I want to hear the answer they gave him. The answer is very important. I think it's still in verse 28. Um, now Eliab had them spoken, the men, and Eliab angered was arose against David. I want to skip this. What has happened? Okay, verse 29. David said, what have I done? Then he turned from him towards another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first, uh, as the first one did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, the word that David spoke about who is this Philist uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the Lord, we are heard. This we are now reported to Saul the king. By the way, the reward is that you will be married, you, you will get the daughter of the king. That is one. And then your household will be exempted from paying taxes. I mean, who doesn't want that? <laughs> I don't have to even fill out them forms. I'm, I'm exempted. But then the people had this discussion and then they reported this to the king. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for him. The king sent for this little boy. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came, and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by, the, by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, he kept emphasizing the fact that the Philistine was actually uncircumcised. <laughs> it's like, hello, Saul. We're talking of an unsaved Person. We're talking of somebody that is not connected to the Almighty God. He said, he said but uh, your servant, uh, Philistine, will be like one of them. So he sees the Philistine as one of the animals. It will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the power of the lion and, the, and from the power of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Why will a king want to sacrifice a youth? Why? 
why will you be assigned to a task that is bigger than you? All David did was to give his testimony. When David appeared before the king, he just said, it's testimony time. This is what the Lord has done for me. And with this, it will be the same story. Your testimony will make you sit with kings. Your testimony will change the views of your boss or whoever is your leader about you. Because it was David's testimony, not his size, not that he could go to war. David was not old enough. As a matter of fact, these days, they will say he's child soldiers, and that is an abuse. You don't send little children to go to war, but because David gave his testimony. Have you given your testimony of late? You have friends, and your testimony can actually change their hearts. I've just started giving you my testimony, of course, with my brother, Yetin Lemba. And I'm going to finish it up. If I don't, please just remind me, because at times one could uh, forget. Just remind me. So our testimony is powerful. So David gave this testimony to the king, and the king said to him, okay, go. Then the king made a mistake and gave David the armory to put on. David said, I'm not used to this. I've not tested them. Never you use a weapon that you've never tried. You remember the sons of Scaphus? They went around casting out demons in the name of Jesus that Paul served. They have no experience. They have no personal relationship with the Jesus of Paul. But they wanted the power that they saw was coming out from Paul, and they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul serves, we command you to come out of them. Well, the demons didn't come out of them. The demons took a hold of them and gave them a thorough beating. <laughs> Never you use a weapon that you've not tried. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse, I think it's around verse... Uh, now, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, says that strong meat is for the mature who by constant use have trained their minds to differentiate between good and evil. By constant use. There is the law of constant use. If you're used to doing something, if you're used to serving God, if you're used to the Word of God, if you have saturated yourself with the Word of God, when a situation shows up, guess what? The Word will show up. You don't wait until the situation comes up, then you start flipping through the Word. So be prepared, be equipped. David was speaking out of his experience with God. He said, God delivered me. And if God did it for me, he will deliver this uncircumcised Philistine to me. Emphasis, uncircumcised. <laughs> so please, your testimony is important. Your word must match your life. That is a testimony. What you say and what you do must agree. That is what makes it powerful. If you're always saying, you know what? People don't keep to time in this place. I'm on the only one that is keeping to time. And then you show up late. Those words will have no power. Your life and your words must be in agreement. Then David now encountered Goliath face to face. He has gotten the permission to do what? To face Goliath. So now he's encountering Goliath face to face. If you look at verse 45, let's read from verse 45. 
Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will, I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, he added, and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That all may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into my hand. David took the attention of everybody from this young little boy, handsome young little boy, to the almighty God. When you are faced with a situation, you need to take the attention of the situation and begin to focus on the almighty God. While everybody was looking at Goliath, Army against army. The physical against the physical. David came in and introduced the spiritual component. And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? The people didn't even remember that he was an uncircumcised Philistine. David had to remind King Saul, but he is an uncircumcised Philistine. And we are the people of God. He is not defying us, it's the almighty God. And so he was able to take the attention of everybody towards who? To God. The problem is we love the attention. That's our problem. We don't magnify our God over our situations. We magnify our problems. Our problems are giants. But we've got an almighty God. So what we need to do when we encounter a situation that terrorizes us, that intimidates us, let's magnify the almighty God, the one we serve. Some of us are still very religious. Coming to church is part of my religion. Filling out the form. What is your religion? Christianity. No. You need a personal relationship with the almighty God. When we cry or when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, we are declaring that he is our Father. Can somebody be your Father without a relationship with you? No. This is the only religion or the only faith where we can call God Father. You try to call God call God Father in some other religions or chop off your head. They'll tell you, who are you? Who, who, who are you to be linking yourself with the Almighty? But our God is personal. Don't magnify your problem. Magnify God. Let God shut up. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through who? Through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So David said to Saul, I can't go to battle with this armory. I'm not used to them. I've not tested them. He picked five stones and a sling. That's what I'm used to. You can imagine David was all exposed. And all he had was a sling and five stones. And Goliath was the almighty champion with all the armory. With a helmet on and virtually everything covered. In fact, even his food, everything was covered. But usually on the helmet, there's a little tiny hole. I think it allows for air to breathe. Because if you see the armory, it's, 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 it's 
really something. All that God needs is a little tiny hole. And all he needs from you is to just honor him in the situation. David said that all this may know. When last did you pray? God, do this and do that. That they may know. When we got chased out of church, It wasn't funny, I can tell you, especially that Sunday morning. That's the only Sunday morning I've once woken up in my life. I didn't know where to go to church. Wake up the following day and you are. Now, remember, I was almost like the assistant pastor there because I was an elder. And I was the only elder. So it was the pastor, the elder, and the deacons. I preached several times on the pulpit just to give you context. And I'm saying this because of all the former members of that congregation that are here, because we have an announcement to make for you. Okay, just, just follow me, I have an, an announcement to make. We left and I said to my friends, we were called as soon as the pastor made up his mind to send us away, he nicknamed us the four gentlemen. <laughs> Our WhatsApp group is actually called Gentlemen. And so, we met, we prayed, we encouraged one another, we became close, we stayed, and I said to them, we haven't seen the end of the general council. We're talking of the general council for the, for the movement of that church. So it's not just the local assembly pastor now that dismiss us, it was all the pastors from all the other places, from Wallfish Bay, from uh, Swakop, from Katima, from Tumep, I think also uh, uh, this to the south, Ochivarongo. Okay, you see, okay. Okay, okay, okay. It was the whole, I mean, with their wives. And the letter said specifically, you have been dismissed with your family. So that's why I couldn't say to Elizabeth, go to church, I'm not going to church. I couldn't say that. But I said to them, we haven't seen the end of this. I said, they will call us. I was actually being bold because I was like the elder and I had to encourage this congregation of four <laughs> without a pastor, without a church. And I, we prayed. And I said, please, let's forgive these people and let's pray for them. So way back in 2013, we've forgiven them. We we're just praying for them. Guess what? Yesterday, we had a sitting with the general council. When pastor said to me, share your defining moment, I was just thinking, which one will it be? Will it be the first time Pastor Mike invited me for breakfast and started to relate with me? Could it, or, or was it the first time he asked me to preach and I said to him, wow, wow, let me tell you my story before you put me on your pulpit. <laughs> because those were all defining moments. You just heard about me. I mean, you don't know me, so let me tell you where I'm coming from. But after our meeting yesterday, and the request from the council to please tell as many people as we are affected because of our dismissal, because as soon as we were dismissed, first of all, the whole worship team, literally, the whole worship team was gone the following Sunday. Literally. Now, I don't want to exaggerate, so I don't know, I can't give you a percentage, but a great number of the church. This is a church where Sydney, 
<clears throat> he was in that church. This is a church where we, we became, the, 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 the small church became too small for us. We had to move to the bigger. But yesterday, we had a meeting with them. And we clarified certain issues. You know, forgiveness is not forgiveness until you know what exactly you are forgiven. We shed some tears. Yeah. It was my defining moment. It was my divided moment. The moment they called us and they said they wanted to have a meeting with us, and I just remembered that I said they will call us. I'm not a prophet. I'm just a minister of God. Please, for those of you that were in that church, You can call Pastor Seth. You can call Pastor, Cosmo, uh, Pastor Gustav. You can call them. Just let them know that they did the right thing. And let them know that you are not holding any grudge against them. They wanted a situation where we could all have a meeting where everybody that was affected will come together. But where will they start? Are they going to put a, an advert in the newspaper? How, how will they start? I mean, I remember I told Pastor Mike as soon as I came out of the meeting, and Pastor Mike in his characteristic way, he said, I hope you told them you're happy where you are. <laughs> I said, yes, Pastor, I'm, I'm very happy where I am. I'm very happy where I am. Let me close with Psalms 27. Psalms 27. From verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The antidote for fear is the fear of the Lord. The antidote for fear is the fear of the Lord. If you have the fear of the Lord in your life, you fear no man. I remember during the first hearing, there was something that really was to my mind the main issue for the problem. It was a book. And I told the council in no ambiguous terms that that book was a recipe for cult. I had no regret. Took them several years, but they could see the truth. If you have God in you, 
you can stand before kings and declare the counsel of the living God. If you have God with you, he will fight your battles on your behalf. It doesn't matter what you're going through. God will stand for you. He's got your back. Let's stand up. Once I was young, now I am old, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. No, his children beg for bread. David said that, and I'm saying that from my experience with walking with the Lord. I made this decision in 1976. 1976, I took the decision to follow God and Him alone. I have never regretted it. Maybe you are here this morning. Maybe you are sitting on the fence. Maybe you've never really given your life to God. You've never really said, God, look, I have tried to manage it, but you can see the mess I've made out of it. Can you just take it and manage it for me? Maybe you just want to completely turn your life over to God. We would like to pray with you and connect you to this God. The God that David served. David was not at the age that he was supposed to go to war. But because God was with him, He was able to defeat the giant. With God, you can defeat the giant. If you want to make a personal commitment to God, can you raise up your hand wherever you are? This is an opportunity for you now. Raise it up. I can see that hand. Thank you. I can see that hand. Any more hands? Don't be ashamed. This is the moment of truth. This is the time that you say, God, take over. Any more hands? I've seen that hand. And yes, I can see that hand. Any more hands? Any more hands? Okay, for those of you that lift up your hands, want to really have a personal contact with you and to pray with you and to also give you some guidance. So please, if you just take your Bible, take your things, the things you came here with, and just come to the front. Our leaders are in front to welcome you and congregation, let's please cheer for them. So please, if you raise up your hand, just come to the front. Just come to the front, just come to the front. Just come to the front. Just come to the front. Come to the front, come to the front. Hallelujah. 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 I still want to give you an opportunity. You're still standing there contemplating, should I, should I not? The fact that you're contemplating means that you should. This is not a decision that you take very lightly. And this is not something that you assume, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. No, you have to be absolutely sure. I've told you, 1976, I was 14 years old, and I made that decision. I can still remember the missionary woman that prayed with me. She took me by the side and prayed with me. Mrs. Grutos, that's the name. She prayed with me. So can you turn to your neighbor to the left and to the right? Just ask them, are you saved? Do you want me to walk with you? Because we don't want to leave this place with anybody living unsafe. We want everybody to leave this place with a touch of Christ. 
we will give you a little time. This is the most important aspect of the service, so we don't rush this moment. Any more people coming forward? Well, if you can come out now, you can still come out anytime. You can talk to us. You can speak to the leaders. You can just call one of us by the side and say, you know what, I really wanted to go out, but I couldn't. We will not be angry with you. We will pray with you. God will still answer your prayer. Okay? And those of you that are in front, we're so happy that you're out here. You have demonstrated that you are interested in giving your life to Christ. And so I would like you to raise your hand up to God and the congregation just stretch out your hands towards them and just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for Jesus Christ who died in my place. I accept him today as my Lord and Savior. I thank you that everything has been made new in Christ. Thank you for writing my name in the book of life. I will not turn back again. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Glory. So if you just, if you just turn today to, your, to my right, you will see Edison. Just go with Edison. He will, they will talk to you a little bit more and also provide you with some more information. God bless you. Amen. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've been blessed. Do we have any more announcements? No? No any more announcements? Okay, shall let's pray. Father, we thank you that we will be winners all through the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. A Saturday all through, we shall win in the name of Jesus Christ. Wherever we go, Father Lord, we will represent you in the name of Jesus. We will lift up your name and magnify you over our situation. We will magnify you over our problems. We will lift you high because you are the almighty God. Father, we give you praise. We pray for everyone that is here as we leave, that we will live with you. We will not leave you behind. We will walk with you. You will be with us all throughout our all throughout the, the week and the rest of our years that we will continue to dwell in the house of the Lord, to behold you and to inquire of you in everything in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Okay, the, the, books that we are, uh, the books that we are on sale are still available. You can still buy the book and uh, uh, Lady B is still signing the book so you can buy the book and she will still sign it. You can also pre-order Lady T's book, okay, at the counter there. God bless you. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, light.